Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. We're so glad you're here with us this day. We um, just, it's a joyous day to be together and to, uh, to spend time with the Lord. Uh, for announcements, I'd just like to remind you that the third Wednesday of the month, so not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, we will be having guests for prayer service. There will be a, a joint congregational, several congregations will, will be here for prayer service. Uh, so uh, as you can see, uh, we're trying to do a little work on the building, get some things cleaned up. Somebody asked me if we were going to have a work day, and I suppose that would be a good idea. Uh, if you have some time in your schedule to come up and do some things, that's great because I know everybody's schedules all over everywhere. Uh, but anyway, I uh, just want to remind you uh, of that. Uh, and I don't know that I have any other announcements immediately for or not. I can't think of anything else. Does anybody have anything? That, uh, Marilyn? Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. The second Saturday of September, there will be a men's breakfast here. We will be hosting a men's breakfast. So, but I uh, uh, appreciate that, Marilyn, because the way I operate, if it isn't in this week, I've got plenty of time. So, <laughs> so I, re I, went, I had a little calendar book one time that you carry in your pocket, and it had little quotes in it, and one of the quotes in it, in fact, the only quote that I remember from it is, if it wasn't for the last minute, a whole lot of stuff wouldn't get done. So, so uh, unfortunately, I think there are many times when I'm a last minute kind of guy. There are things I do try to address more timely, but uh, uh, life happens, uh, birthdays happen, things happen. And so I'm very appreciative uh, of the graciousness and the mercy that we have towards each other, recognizing that, that things happen. So anyway, we, uh, we're very blessed to be able to be here today and uh, worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, for a call to worship, I'd like to read from Psalms 108, verses 3 through 5. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people, and I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth. Let's uh, turn on our hymnal to number th 23. Number 23 uh, in the um, Restoration Hymnal. And we'll stand to sing this and remain standing for the opening prayer by Brother Bill Moore.
Our Father, indeed, we come before you with singing those praises that uh, allow us to see the joy of having come before you in peace and in hope of that kingdom that is to come. We pray that as we have gathered here together, that your spirit might be the dominating, dominating force here, that each of us can feel that spirit that allows us to see your great love for us. So as we listen to those that have prepared and brought before us this day, we do ask your greatest joy and dominating factor in their speech this day, that indeed they might have that freedom of thought that gives us that hope that you have promised to us. So just bless us in those ways that we need, that indeed we can recognize that we are loved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother, could you grab the basket for the offering? That something I forgot to take care of before. <laughs> Roland's preoccupied. <laughs> um, so, uh, offerings are always difficult for me in, in many ways because, you know, everyone's aware that it, it takes money to to run a to run a building and again you know we've got some repairs going on and some some things like that uh, uh, had a door break Monday coming up to do some other work uh, made a got it fixed had to I had to call a door company to come in and do the work I uh, didn't have time to personally sort through it all it was a little different than something anything I'd ever done before and then uh, we had other things going on. But last night, I uh, attended a, a, a dinner. I had a co-worker, um, 25 anniversaries, years at, at work. But he's been off work the last two years with cancer. It's a reoccurrence thing. And um, it's really questionable if he's going to get to ever come back to work. It's an interesting situation. He's not getting better, but he's not getting worse. But he's had some side effects from medication. It affects his walking and things like that. And uh, another co-worker and I uh, rode together. It was over in Overland Park. And we were coming back, and I 435, pardon me, 435 was backed up. My, I was driving. Uh, Randy caught that the highway was backed up so I was able to maneuver uh, and avoid getting caught in that traffic and found some back roads to go through and it was dark but you could tell that we were driving through some big fancy houses and and you know and Randy made the comments man it'd be nice to see these in the daylight just to see what's going on here you know and we began to talk about uh, wealth and uh, Randy himself had beat leukemia and um, you know, just a lot of things going on in life and it's he made the comment about you know can't imagine what it kind of, how much money it takes to live in a house like that and I said yeah and how much it takes to keep it clean I says for a single guy I live in a big house and I can't keep it clean. <laughs> but I said, you know, Randy, it's always, while I would always enjoy having more money so I think I could do more things, I've lived a very rich life. I've, I have not gone to bed hungry except by my choice. I've not gone cold and hungry, I've not gone wet. I've experienced many, many wonderful things in life, been many places. And while I don't consider myself wealthy with a bank account, 
And if you look at global and national averages, even that, I'm a wealthy man. But most importantly, I'm an extremely wealthy man because of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life and blessing me with you all in my life. And yeah, we've been through some things at times that were extremely difficult for whatever reasons those were. But we are a wealthy people, blessed highly of the Lord. And so that's part of what we have to share as we read in Sunday school about being a salt of the earth and light into the world and bearing testimony of the Lord's goodness in our life. So often we say we don't think that the Lord, re- you know, that we really have a testimony to bear. But the biggest testimony we bear is how we live life every day. And that's challenging at times when there's another individual irritating you or you're struggling with or whatever. But that is truly an offering we make to the Lord is how we live our life every day. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the many blessings of life, and so many of them are even beyond dollars and cents, Father. And I'm especially concerned at times, Father, about how many blessings do I even fail to perceive that you pour out upon my life, and how small my thanksgiving in verbalizing that back to you is. For truly, Father, there is no existence in life if we are not upheld by you in all things and so father this morning as we collect this offering and some of us will be able to put money into the the basket and some of us won't but our desires to offer ourselves to you is no less regardless of what we are capable to physically offer and so father in the name of jesus christ your only begotten Son, I ask that you look down upon this offering, find it acceptable, and bless it as only you can do, that it might accomplish way more than it appears that it can. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Laurie. That was a very appropriate. <laughs> Give me thy heart. Very appropriate music for our offertory. Um, let's turn in our hymnal to number 152. 152. God of the earth, the sky, the sea. We will remain seated to sing this.
now I would ask for your prayers and attention for our brother Jonathan Staten as he brings the words of life to us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Most of the scripture verses I have to speak from today come from the Doctrine and Covenants, although you will see that they all tie back to all of the other scriptures. And in light of us not having a clock over here, I will pay a little bit of attention to the time I know I can speak for a long period of time if I'm not paying attention. So the first verses I want to read from the Doctrine and Covenants come from section 85, 12b. Unto what shall I liken these kingdoms, that ye may understand? Behold, all these are kingdoms, and any man who hath seen any, or the least of these, hath seen God moving in his majesty and power. I say unto you, he hath seen him. Nevertheless, he who came unto his own was not comprehended. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Nevertheless, the day shall come when you shall comprehend even God, being quickened in him and by him. Now this ties back to the New Testament. Do you remember those verses? The light came into the world and the world did not comprehend it. That also ties back to the Old Testament. There's a campfire song with no apparent beauty that man should him desire. That's a prophecy of Christ. That when he should walk this earth, he was not declaring openly who he was if the son of God had walked with his true identity fully revealed he would not have fulfilled that prophecy now if we go back in the same section to verse 9 all kingdoms have a law given and there are many kingdoms for there is no space in the which there is no kingdom, and there is no kingdom in the which there is no space, either a greater or lesser kingdom. And unto every kingdom is given a law, and unto every law there are certain bounds also and conditions. All beings who abide not in those conditions are not justified, for intelligence cleaveth unto intelligence. Wisdom receiveth wisdom, truth embraceth truth, virtue loveth virtue, light cleaveth unto light. Mercy hath compassion on mercy, and claimeth her own. Justice continueth in its course, and claimeth its own. Judgment goeth before the face of him who sitteth upon the throne, and governeth, and executeth all things. He comprehendeth all things. And all things are before him, and all things are round about him. And he is above all things, and in all things, and is through all things, and is round about all things, and all things are by him and of him, even God forever and ever. Now, I'm going to say something, and... It is my opinion, but I believe it ties correctly into the scriptures. I believe that when we try to say something is only physical, that that's not entirely true. That when scientists study science, if they, de if they dive deep enough into it, they will be studying spiritual things. And we speak about kingdoms and laws, and in terms of science, the, the, the phrase law comes up most often in the laws of physics. 
But if you dive deeply enough into the laws of physics, you will have to realize that you have just slid into the study of spiritual reality. When you study physics and you study light and how things interact, and I've spoken this before, that if you take two photons of light and create a relationship between them so that they are tied together, you can take that one photon of light, you can move it anywhere. I'm, I mean anywhere. It could be across the universe. And if you do something to this photon of light, spin it, poke it, move it around, the other photon of light will do everything that is happening to this photon of light. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And he said, whatever you do unto the least of these who believe in me, you are doing, you are doing it to me. And all these kingdoms have laws. When Jesus walked this earth, did he not say the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Was he not referring to himself? When we are told that Jesus is the word of God, when he, he told his disciples, nothing I do except the Father has commanded it. He said, whatever you see me doing, the Father commanded me to do it. And you think about everything that means. When he drove out the money changer from the temple, that was not him personally being offended. That was the Father, the, the living God of heaven, who said, drive them out. I am angry with them. I will not tolerate what they are doing in my house any longer. He said, get them out. He said, I will not have my temple be a den of thieves and robbers. Everything he did was at the command of God. So when he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was someone who was in front of everyone obeying every last command of God. Now, if we turn in our scriptures, section 43, 5a. Hearken ye, for behold, the great day of the Lord is nigh at hand. For the day cometh that the Lord shall utter his voice out of the heaven. The heavens shall shake and the earth shall tremble. And the trump of God shall sound both long and loud and say to the sleeping nations, Ye saints, arise and live. Ye sinners, stay and sleep until I shall call again. Wherefore, gird up your loins, lest ye be found among the wicked. Lift up your voices and spare not. Call upon the nations to repent, both old and young, both bond and free, saying, Prepare yourselves for the great day of the Lord. For if I, who am a man, do lift up my voice and call upon you to repent, and ye hate me, what will ye say when the day cometh? When the thunders shall utter their voices from the ends of the earth, speaking to the ears of all that live, saying, Repent, and prepare for the great day of the Lord, yea, and again. When the lightnings shall streak forth from the east unto the west, and shall utter forth their voices unto all that live, and make the ears of all tingle that hear, saying these words, Repent ye, for the great day of the Lord is come. And again the Lord shall utter his voice out of heaven, saying, Hearken, O ye nations of the earth, and hear the words of that God who made you. O ye nations of the earth, how often would I have gathered you together, as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. How oft have I called upon you by the mouth of my servants, 
and by the ministering of angels, and by mine own voice, and by the voice of thunderings, and by the voice of lightnings, and by the voice of tempests, and by the voice of earthquakes, and great hailstorms, and by the voice of famines and pestilences of every kind, and by the great sound of a trump, and by the voice of judgment, and by the voice of mercy all the day long, and by the voice of glory and honor, and the riches of eternal life, and would have saved you with an everlasting salvation, but ye would not? Behold, the day has come when the cup of the wrath of mine indignation is full. And the choice that everyone faces is what kingdom will you abide by? The scriptures talk about three general levels of glory. And sometimes we tell ourselves, well, I don't feel good enough for celestial glory. Therefore, it, I, I think sometimes we have this perspective that that maybe if we're not good enough, that we should not aim for that. But it was never about us being good enough. It's always the merits of Christ, is it not? Amen. Is Jesus Christ good enough to live in celestial glory? Yes. And if it's by his merits that we are justified, his blood that he sacrificed for us. Now, how often in these verses did it say, but ye would not? It's no shortcoming on the part of God as to whether someone is saved. It's not him failing. We have to accept it. We are told you have to believe. When Jesus said, if you will believe on me, you will believe in the Father. He said, if you will believe in God, believe in me too. He said, no man cometh to the Father except by me. And he could say that because the, the Heavenly Father sent him. He said, you go and be the way that people come to me. And he did everything that the Father asked of him. Now, I think back to uh, all the times that I've heard Handel's Messiah. Also, a testimony shared by Arthur Oakman. I really, I, I just love hearing his stories. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God. Do you remember Arthur Oakman's story? He was over in Germany. He came from England. And this was when the Nazi political party was in power. And to make it really simplified, they were dangerous people, okay? You could, you could say something that one of them didn't like and they could just throw you in prison. Just no recourse of justice. They just tossed you in prison, that was it. And he had arrived with a German saint and they were passing through a point where there was a government official who uh, was going to be speaking to him and asking him, you know, why are you here? And uh, one of the things that the Nazi political party was pushing was this idea that what they had going on was going to last a thousand years. They called it the Third Reich, and they were really just hammering that. And you know, so he, you know, what are you? Why are you here? Well, you know, I'm here to share the gospel of Christ. And he, he got in his face. You know, what do you guys teach about the Third Reich? You know, about when we teach that it's going to last a thousand years. And I think Arthur Oakman might have been a little provoked. He goes, I don't care what you guys teach about that. Our church doesn't care. 
We teach what the scriptures have to say. We don't care how long your, your kingdom lasts. That means nothing to us because the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God. And he said that uh, because of one of the features of, of what the, the National Socialists were pushing, they were really big on evolution. That was a huge underpinning of all their philosophy. And they, they liked the idea of something becoming something else. So, so uh, it appealed to his sense of evolution. So that, that softened him up, but he also saw that Arthur Oakman was not afraid. The German citizen was shaking. He was terrified. I, I mean, he, he, was, he, was, he knew. He's like, no, these guys, the guy that you're talking to is a, part of, a particular part of the government known for grabbing people and disappearing them. Arthur Oakman was standing there with no fear. Why was he standing there with no fear? Spirit of God is not fear. Perfect love casteth out all fear. So he's standing there, and on top of that, if the man had acted against him, he was willing to pay that price. He, I'm here to serve God, no matter what. But he also knew that God would stand by him now, the Book of Mormon, was there not a group of young men who ended up doing missionary work to people who had a history of taking pleasure in murdering other people, especially of their culture? So, and they went in there, and they had a promise that they would be preserved. I want to turn Doctrine and Covenants section 38 5a but verily I say unto you that in time ye shall have no king nor ruler for I will be your king and watch over you wherefore hear my voice and follow me and you shall be a free people and you shall have no laws but my laws. And when I come, for I am your lawgiver, and what can stay my hand? I'll take a moment to picture this, what that's going to be like. Human history has just all, all been a history of people having to deal with the nonsense that somebody else came up with, particularly in the area of law, right? Arthur Oakman was dealing with the, the craziness that, that the Nazis did. They, they had some horrible laws, right? Have you ever been in a law library? Anybody been in a law library? I've been into a law library. If you stop and think about what you're looking at, it will make you cringe. For the state of Missouri, for one state out of 50 states, this is not the federal level. Rows and rows and rows of shelves. Great big thick books. The sheer volume of laws that somebody decided had to be passed. How much of those actually relate to making something work? How many of those? How many of those are just to exercise power and authority over people, to feel that you're in control of them, to take from people? Now, this is why we have something beautiful and positive to look forward to. If, if the laws of man tended to be actually pretty good, this wouldn't be that big of a promise, right? Right? I will be your king. You will have no laws but mine. What, what does all good come from? What, what direction? Everything that is good comes from God. 
We can stand and make a safe reason. If everything that is good comes from God, the laws that come from God are good. They bring good into our lives. They preserve good. Lord only desires good things for us. One of the things that uh, you may eventually come to realize, maybe already, that uh, the kingdom that you end up in is the one that's going to be the most comfortable for you. It's where you will feel at home, right? If you take someone who has lived in rebellion, hardened their heart, they have no interest in God, and you just stick them in heaven in the presence of God, what's that going to be like for them? It's not going to be pleasant. Their existence is going to be filled with the awareness that they do not belong. And they're going to be terrified. Rather than being able to experience the love of God, the peace of his presence, they're not going to enjoy that. So you realize that this is an aspect of how God is good to create a way for everyone to have a way to exist that's going to be the best for them according to their choices. Now, the lesser glories are not as good. They're not as good. You realize that even, even in hell, God created a way for people to exist if that was what they were most comfortable with and what they chose. And that's the other thing. It's, this, is all, this is all choice that people make. It is all choice. And we have to, we have to stop and realize that we have an effect on people's choices, right? Yesterday I got to see a group of people who were just really out doing good things and realizing that, that uh, the choices that they were make or that they were making, sooner or later we will see that they have a positive effect on the choices that other people make and that uh, we look forward to Zion and Zion being a place of refuge. There are people that they may not even know that much about Zion, but the Lord has directed them to do everything they can to make this area that kind of a thing. They're, they're growing and learning in making this place a place of refuge, a place where it's safe to be, ministering to people who do not have. And the day will come when we have Zion, that there will be no poor among them. That's, that's who this ministry is very, very focused on, people who are truly the definition of poor. And what is the definition of poor? For me, it's you don't have what you need, and you can't get it. All right? If you have everything you need, are you poor? Not really, no. If you have everything you need. That's, uh, look through the Book of Mormon. Interesting way that they describe this. When the different families of people that came to America when they first came over, you realize that they went through stages. When they first arrived, they, had, they were living on the supplies they brought. And it was left to them to build a society, right? And at one point it mentions that after they had gone to all this work, uh, the, the women were focused on producing fabric and the men were, were producing food and all this stuff. And then it says, and at this point, they had everything they needed. And you realize they must have gone through a period of time where they did not. It wasn't until they had been industrious for a period of time that they had everything they needed. But they they stuck with it even, even though for a while they didn't, I mean, I, who knows what they went without? We don't really know everything that they went without. But they had reached that point, and the Lord blessed them. 
We need to be a people who, who can benefit from those blessings. Uh, later on in section 38, here's something that the Lord told the church. And if you seek the riches, which it is the will of the Father to give unto you, ye shall be the richest of all people, for ye shall have the riches of eternity. Right? These are, a lot of what the Lord has to give us is greater than just stuff. Right? And it must needs be that the riches of the earth are mine to give, but beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. Nephites grew wealthy and they grew proud. And they were not living as a people who were living in the kingdom where God's laws were being followed. What's the definition of a kingdom? What is a kingdom? If you say, okay, this is the kingdom of thus and such. Who, if it's God's kingdom, God is the king, right? If it's the, the kingdom of the jungle, you know, following the, the, the so-called the laws of the jungle, right? Then the laws that apply to that are, are what are in force. So the kingdom of heaven are the laws of heaven that are in force. The kingdom of God, the laws of God are in force. So at all times we have to keep stopping and thinking, what are the laws that we will abide by? What are they? How many times have we been told in the Doctrine of Covenants, Zion could have been already redeemed but you wouldn't do what I told you to do. The testimony of Enoch. He, he just did what God told him to do. That's how they built Zion. That's how they built it so quickly. God called on him. It astonished him at first. He said, I, I, I don't understand why you're calling on me. You know, I'm, I'm just a kid in my society. I, you know, nobody really is going to be lined up to listen to me, right? And God called on him. He said, do this? Well, he did it. Imagine we have the opportunity to find ourselves in a position where God says, and we do it. Well, that is the kingdom of God in operation. And the kingdom of God in operation in this world results in people that God will look down and say you are Zion because you're living together in righteousness and there's no poor among you and no poor among you sometimes the world we live in can be very hard hearted right and if the, if the world around us took that phrase what, what would they do they just say, okay, let's find all the poor and kick them out, right? Okay, we don't have any poor among us. What does God say? He says, bear one another's burdens. Right? And we have, there are, there are places in this world, overseas, where, where like in, in a village situation, where they're all Christian believers. And on a daily basis, they are in each other's lives. So they, they if someone has a, a prayer need, as we call it, right? They already know it, not because somebody was gossiping it or whispering or that was the rumor going around. They know it because they were in their lives. And it is an everyday thing and the children grow up with this and that is the reality that they see and and so the the rate of children going up to carry on with believing in God and Christ is I mean this close to 100 percent is they see it in action one of the things 
that we struggle with here is we're spread out. How are we in each other's lives on a daily basis? And we are making progress, I think. We are moving forward in, in any time we do something for each other, the more time we spend around each other, just getting life done, we are creating that relationship. Uh, some people call it tying strings. That Say, if you have children, children uh, are sometimes described as saying that play and work are the same thing to them. You want to work, they want to play, you know, but they also want to chip in and help. And they can be very helpful. And in all those instances where you are spending that time with them and building up that relationship, that's tying a string. And the saints are meant to have those strings tied between all of them, right? And those strings, you tug on that over here, your relationship with that person, they feel it over there. Because they're not truly way over there. You've got that string, that relationship tying you together, right? I remember many of the testimonies that I heard as a child growing up in the RLDS church. And one of the things that was just, I just always thought was just so neat, was that if you were a member here in the States, you could go overseas, anywhere, to someone who didn't speak your language, who didn't look like you, had never met you or heard of you. But if they were fellow believers, if they were fellow members of the church, you, you knew what they believed. And you knew, hey, I'm in the same church too. It was welcome brother or sister, give me a hug time right how many testimonies have I heard of that growing up well that's that's the relationship that Jesus wants to see among us when you consider the flesh of a human body if you have a part where the circulation starts starts declining and if that circulation completely goes away, what happens? It dies off. And it's pretty bad, right? But if that part of your body that has that declining circulation begins to get the circulation back, what happens? The appearance changes. You can see the return of health, right? You see, hey, this is getting better. And that circulation is meant to be in the body of Christ. It is meant to be healthy. It says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And just like the circulation of a human body or the sap in a, in a tree that flows around, we are meant to have that circulation. We are meant to have that. And I look forward to the day when the prophecy is fulfilled that the kingdom of God will roll forth as a stone that has not been cut by hands and displaces everything else. That the chains of darkness that are around this world will be crushed. That, that organization, the, the charitable organization that I uh, visited with yesterday, they are facing the chains of darkness that are around this world. And those chains of darkness, the details of which are, they're just too awful to, to go into detail from a location that is designated for only speaking the word of God. Okay, but they're bad. And the kingdom of God will crush those chains. They will be broken. These are the chains of the devil that keep people in darkness, that would separate us from God. So we pray for Zion, and we pray for the kingdom of God, where it is the rules and the laws of God are what in control.
So I ask that uh, in concluding this, that that be part of your perspective in your daily life, everything you look at, everything you pray about, that is for Zion and the kingdom of God. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jonathan. You've uh, challenged us to uh, take inventory of our life and see how we're living. I appreciate that very much. Let's uh, turn on our hymnal to number 86. Number 86, Hope of the World. We'll stand to sing this and remain standing for our closing prayer. Father in heaven, we thank thee for the, again, for the opportunity to be here this day and to hear about the hope of the world through thy son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I ask that uh, as we have heard this day, your words, that we would uh, ponder upon them and implement them into our life 
by thy guidance and direction. Thank you, Father, for uh, loving us so much that you made yourself known unto us. In Jesus' name, amen.